my overall advice would be to school administrators, because there's a huge teacher shortage. And when you ask teachers why, they will almost always say, because my freedom to teach the way I want to teach is gone. The teachers are not recommending that their children and grandchildren become teachers because it's not been a joyful ride. And it should be. It should be really, really joyful. Hello, and welcome to the Eternal Optimist podcast. My name is Matt Drinkon, and I am your host in this journey of eternal optimism. And what is eternal optimism? It is taking whatever's happening in front of us, seeing it through a positive lens, and all the challenges and all the good stuff and everything in between, we learn from it all. And we learn to use that to our advantage and for the advantage of the world. And to tell you what, there's so much negative stuff out there right now with the news and with social media. And you hit and you're bombarded on all sides by all types of digital distractions. The world needs a place that they can relax, they can hear some inspiration and some positive. And guess what? This is it. Before we get started, I want to encourage you. You can connect with me on social media, on Instagram or Facebook at Eternal Optimist Podcast accounts. I also do a live stream every morning, Monday through Friday. It's 7 o'clock a.m. Eastern time where we'll cover things I'm learning. I'll read a journal entry every day and give you the opportunity, if you'd like to join me, to learn right alongside with me in this amazing, amazing roller coaster that we call life. Today's episode, it is my sincere pleasure to bring to you a man, Mr. Lyle Lee Jenkins. Mr. Jenkins. And I learned so much in this conversation. By the end of it, I had taken so many notes I went to share with my wife so we could work on how we show up as parents. I took notes and took it to my business to think about lessons I might learn to show up as a strong leader. We are attempting to answer a number of questions in this show. We first talk about the three reasons that are causing pain that makes teaching so difficult. How might we tap into what really inspires learning so that the will and the thrill are there? What we're really teaching in schools today might be intended to offer the skill to succeed. However, when the will to learn and the thrill of learning are sapped, nothing happens. And Dr. Jenkins is going to share how we bring it back. Lee shares how we might create a visual record of their progress to keep them loving the learning. Lee talks about helping people, and this is actually his life's mission, is to help people know the power of looking for root causes to problems instead of so much focus upon symptoms. People understand they want doctors to look for root causes, but the same understanding is not present for education. Dr. Jenkins has written a number of books, of articles. He's, he's had forewords written for the number of books he's written by Jack Canfield, Mark Victor Hansen. He runs in circles of people that have influence and impact. Without going too deep in the bio, I'm going to let him speak for himself. Mr. or Dr. Lyle Lee Jenkins has been an inspiration, and I am better as a father and a businessman by having met him and had a conversation with him. Without any further ado, I'm going to welcome you to a conversation where you will learn something about how to learn, how to teach learning, how to help people with learning. This is an inspirational conversation. Get ready to get into technical nuts and bolts of learning and education with my new friend, Dr. Lyle Lee Jenkins. Enjoy. And now time for a quick break from one of our sponsors. The Eternal Optimist podcast sponsor today is Eternal Optimism. Friends, we learn from our challenges. We can always make a comeback when we're open to the learning. How many times do we take the challenges and the hard things and we get stuck in the moment, we get triggered, and we go down this rabbit hole of emotions and let them get stuck inside of us. We don't let them flow through. Eternal optimism is a way that we can take the challenges that come up, the things that tend to get lodged inside of us, and learn how to convert those painful traumas and those challenges into energy and fuel that can help us move forward towards what we want most, our life's vision or mission. Team, eternal optimism is the solution. It is the pathway forward that can help you to see things in a positive lens and take the challenges and learn from them. Join us in the Eternal Optimist podcast 
as eternal optimists, as we look to make a positive impact in the lives of others through eternal optimism. Now, back to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Eternal Optimist Podcast, the show for optimists by optimists. This is the show for people who see the good in the world and want to make a positive difference in the lives of their families and communities. Each week, you'll hear inspiring stories that will get you thinking bigger and playing more offense in life. With your host and high-performance coach, Matt Drinkon. And with that introduction, I welcome to the show my new friend, Mr. Lee Jenkins. Lee, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you, Matt. It's a joy to be here. And uh, especially to talk to somebody who just says up front, I'm the eternal optimist. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yes, sir. Well, yes. you know it. You know it, brother. I, know it. I can oh. tell it in your voice. You are. Yes. Well, when we say the word eternal optimist, uh, I wonder what does that mean to you when, when you hear eternal optimist? What does that mean? Well, there's eternal. That means there's two parts to that. One is in life's ups and downs that all of us experience, you're an optimist. And then the other part of it, there's the eternal, which is after this life on earth is over, there's optimism there also. That's, it has two meanings. Thank you. That, what's amazing to me is I ask that question on every show. Normally it's the last question, but you started off, so we're starting at the first question. And I like to ask that to everyone, and I always get a little bit different answer, and I really connect with your answer. It's eternal, not just on this plane of existence, not just in this life, eternal. Right. And I think that kind of goes back to my faith, and maybe it touches on our faith. That's I appreciate your reference to eternal in that nature. Well, Lee, uh, we came to meet each other by a recommendation from a uh, now, I'd say a good friend of mine, someone I had on the show in September, and I just met face-to-face, Mark Victor Hansen, and he said, you got to talk to Lee. Lee's awesome. So I wonder, how do you know Mark? An event at a friend's home, a common friend's home, and um, I sat next to my friend, Mike Ingram was his name, and across the table was Mark and Virgil, and we had over a meal in the back patio of a friend's house, and we had a meal together, and then... He called, he looked on my website, l2j.net, and he uh, called me up. And the next day, so we had a good conversation there. And then he said, okay, Lee, you've got a problem. I said, yeah, really? I know that. But tell me what the problem is, you see. He said, there's too many Lee Jenkins authors. And the reason I'm Mark Victor Hansen is because there's too many Mark Hansons. So I changed all my books. They now are Lyle Lee Jenkins. Because there's no other Lyle Lee Jenkins out there uh, writing books, so just that was so the very first time we talked one on one, he's giving me help, and uh, then I'd written a book, How to Create a Perfect School. I can tell you later that's kind of a crazy title, and uh, then working with uh, a close friend from church who's homeschooling her children, I wrote we wrote together How to Create a Perfect Homeschool. I wrote the how-to. She writes, or wrote, I'm sorry, the what happened. So huh. it's put in a different uh, font. It's italics. So you get to read my kind of boring how-to. And then the stories come, make the book come alive because she's there every day with her three children. And here's what happened when I took Lee's advice. So anyway, it, when you look for the books, it's Lyle Lee Jenkins. But uh, I said to Mark, well, what do people call you? They call you Mark Victor? No, they call me Mark. Well, people call me Lee, but only on for looking for the, the books. It's Mark Victor and it's Lyle Lee. Excellent. I can tell already this is going to be a great conversation because we're things that you're passionate about are similar to me. I'm similar to uh, or passionate about schooling and education. Uh, yes. And I, you may have just noticed uh, that my all my kids are home from school right now. It's uh, 4.20 p.m. Eastern. Uh, here on the East Coast. And now all of my seven, six, and four-year-old are all home. And I've already felt them run through the background a couple of times. So uh, yeah, I've seen them running through. Yes, that's great. <laughs> I uh, I appreciate your patience with that and your smile with that. But no, it's a joy. And, it's a joy. It takes I don't no see, patience. I don't see it any other way. It may be at one point, eight years ago, when I started uh, to work virtually and have children and they would be you know crying three rooms away, uh, that would have upset me. And I would have been 
very angry about it. And I started to think about why, why would I be upset or angry at a child? They don't know what they're doing by making yes. noise on a zoom. And so now I, I see them or feel them. I don't get upset about it. I'm eternally grateful that they're here and that they're running around and playing. Yes, you know, of course. Makes me yes. want to play. Uh, <laughs> keeps us young. So if it's we can just working, talking to me. Yes. Well, and, and this is by no means work. This is pretty enjoyable. So I've, mm-hmm. I would love to go straight into, you know, part one of the show is the challenge. You know, I'd love to explore uh, a challenge that you have had in your life. And you can go like right now, all the way back to childhood, just some challenge that is worth mentioning that we might unpack and and see how it might serve our listeners. I'm going to talk about my challenge in the field of education. We know it's a struggle in many ways for the children to reach the standards we have in mind for them. And so the question is, why? Uh, First thing, I spent a lot of time on the why, but one of the most interesting things, and John Hattie, who uh, is probably the the best known educator at this time, has named my research the Jenkins Curve, which is a surprise to me, but it's very simple. I asked 3,000 teachers in various seminars, what grade do you teach and what percent of your kids love school? Simple, two questions. Well, here it is. Kindergarten, kindergarten teacher said 95% of their kids love school. It gets worse at every grade level down to grade nine. We're at 37%. It ticks up slightly in high school. So I have a good friend, high school dropout, made a lot of money, but dropped out of high school. And he said, well, the reason it went down in high school, because they weren't counting people like me. We weren't there. That's why it went up a little bit. Then I asked further, uh, okay, just people, think about the children, your children or your friends or you when you were a junior or senior in high school. What percent of the kids are as excited about learning as a junior and senior in high school as they once were in kindergarten? The answer is always fewer than 10%. That's horrible, man. Yeah, I always loved it. I was one of those that always loved it somehow, and it it came from at home. Uh, you know, just a, a, a well, love of learning. You're, but You're a rare person. I always get that answer, less than 10%. Sometimes they'll give me a percent, eight, sometimes five, but I've never gotten higher than 10. And I know the teachers aren't doing it on purpose. Mm-hmm. That's a given. Mm-hmm. I've never heard of a teacher yet, whether they're a good teacher or not, they don't write in their lesson plans who they want to discourage. So it's not on purpose. So the challenge is, what is it that's causing this? What is it that people inherited that they're transferring on to the next generation that's causing this pain? And it makes teaching so difficult because when you've got a majority of the kids in middle school and high school who don't want to be there, wow, that's tough. So research on, you know, what is it that's causing this? I can give you three. One is uh, we give kids permission to forget. They learn in first grade through spelling or vocabulary. They don't have to learn anything. They just have to know it for Friday. They learn that in about four or five weeks. I'll tell you a story. A grandma has her first grade daughter for the weekend. She'd been in first grade for five weeks. She's dropped off at grandma's house with her backpack. Grandma's going through the backpack. She says, oh, honey, look what you got. You took a spelling test. Yes, Grandma. You only missed two words. What a great job you did, honey. Let's work on those two words. And what does sweet granddaughter say? No, Grandma, we're done with those words. Okay. Now, fast forward to to college. Just recently at a college reunion, one of my friends who knew kind of what I was saying. He said, well, Lee, let me tell you something. I never studied the night before an exam, ever. The reason was I knew I couldn't remember it overnight. So every time I had an exam, I set the alarm for four in the morning. I studied hard from four o'clock in the morning until the test time, and by noon it was gone. So you say, why do kids lose their enthusiasm? Well, if it's just a joke, it's just a game, it's not really learning, it's just a joke. 
it's only to get the grade. It's not real learning. Then, then gradually they say, I don't want to play that game. So that's reason one. Reason two is bribery. We bribe the kids to do the work. And John Hattie in his research, I mentioned his name earlier, he studied 250 influences upon children. There are only four that make it worse. One is retention. There's no evidence that holding a kid back that they learn more, that they catch up because of that. And one is tangible rewards. Makes it worse. Why? Because now they don't, their whole focus is not on learning anymore. It's on getting the reward. The third one I'll mention is, and this is a key part of my work with, with schools and homeschool families, all of it, is we use data for harm instead of data for joy. The numbers that go on a paper, sometimes displayed on the wall to show who the winners and losers are. My How to Create a Perfect School book was, the foreword was by Jack Canfield. So both of them have written a foreword for me. And Jack said, it's an interview that's on my website. He said when he was in military school, after every exam, they posted the scores, the name, the score, the top score in the class, then the next score in the name, the next score in the name. He said, maybe the top two or three kids thought that was good, but the rest of us didn't care. So do we still do that? No, we do it fancier. We make a really fancy bulletin board. It still shows who the winners and losers are. And I've got the photographs from cl actual classrooms that yeah. is displayed on the wall with a token of some kind for every kid moving towards a target. And you see the winners and losers are the second you walk in the room. So when dad is for joy, everything changes. The kids are begging for quizzes. Now here, let me say that again. Write it down. Kids beg for quizzes when joys, when dad is done correctly. Why? Because they want to prove they're smarter today than they ever were before. A grade five teacher, Eastern Nebraska. It's uh, 15 minutes before school's out. She told the kids they're going to take one of their quizzes. And then brand new custodians set the alarm off accidentally. And there they are on the playground and can't take their quiz. Fire alarm went off. So what, what's the attitude of the kids? You'd think they'd be saying, yay, we don't have to do this. No, no, they're mad. Because if that is for joy, they want to take a quiz. And they made the teacher promise that first thing tomorrow morning, they'd get their quiz. So if they're not begging for quizzes, the dad is not helping. It's making things, it's making that spiral of down, down, down on their enthusiasm get worse. You want it when kids get a, a, a paperback that the teacher scored, instead of thinking, how many did I miss? You want them to think, did I do better than I've ever done before? We graph it so they get to see their, their growth all through the year, getting smarter and smarter and smarter throughout the whole year. And by the way, Anybody that's involved in athletics knows this is not new. It's just new for teaching in the classroom. Coaches are always measuring to see if an athlete's doing better than they've done before. In fact, the coaches that know that in athletics, when they're teaching, don't know it. The same person. The other thing we do with data is we add up the total for the whole class. The only thing that goes on the wall is the total for the class. It's like a scoreboard. Okay. It's a team. All of us kids in this room are working together to see if we can do better than we've ever done. The total. Not everyone individually, not stack ranked, because that's only going to work with the people that are the top couple of people might find that pretty cool, but the rest of them, they don't care. Uh, that's not using data for joy. I wish you could be in the classroom when they add up the total for the class and the student in the room, who everybody knows is struggling the most, jumps up and does a chest pump and says, it was me. I'm the one that put us over the top. My three questions right is why we have an all-time best, why we did better than we've ever done before. I did it. Now, we know that from athletics. If you're on the basketball team and you're not a good athlete and the coach puts you in and the other team fouls you because they know you're not very good, but you do make a free throw and your team, team wins by one, what do you think? It was me. I did it, right? Yes. That's the same in the classroom. It happens all the time when dad is for joy instead of data for harm. Now, the, I don't blame the teachers. They don't know how to use data for joy. When they do, it works. The homeschool family I'm working with, 
our pastor at September, he brought two kids up on the up on the platform with him. Yeah. One was in middle school, one in elementary school. The elementary one was in the family that I'm helping to homeschool. He said to the middle school girl, what are you most excited about for school starting again? She said, seeing my friends. She said to the boy, what are you most excited about with school starting again? Quizzes. Can you imagine? That's because they have a, a visual record that I'm getting smarter and smarter and smarter, and they love it. Mm. So that loss of enthusiasm where it gets worse every grade level, and you get less than 10% who want to come to school to learn, there's three of the reasons why. There's more. Those three help get an understanding of, of the system that's causing that. And it's not a blame on the teachers and the educators. It's built in, and they don't know what to do about it. And so. When things aren't working because the kids are unmotivated, then what do we do? We get we bribe them. And half of the kids in school, by in high school, middle school, care about grades, so they accept the bribe. The other half don't care about grades, and the bribe does no good. You say, what's the biggest challenge? First challenge is figuring it out. And the second challenge is what we're doing today, figuring out ways to let people know there's there's a way to solve this problem. Uh, Lee, a question comes up here. So when things aren't working, we bribe them. And maybe it's bribing them through Chick-fil-A. You do this and I'll, I'll give you some Chick-fil-A. Or you sure. do this and you get to you get some reward of some kind. What might be some things that are used as bribes? So we might know as parents or as educators, here are some things that might be bribes. And maybe maybe we should take a second glance at using these. First of all, a bribe is an if-then. Okay. If you do this, then I will do this. Replace them with thank you celebrations. And so you can say, I've been, we count. When I ask you to clean up your rooms, I go in and just count how many things are still laying around. And and I counted it today. And there's fewer things out than ever before. We had our best day ever. We're going to Chick-fil-A tonight. We're going to celebrate. So the homeschool family, they they're keeping track of how well the kids are going doing on these quizzes. But they get a family total, not a class run chart, but a family run chart, the total, the scoreboard for their family. When the family does better than they've done before, they get they, they have a they have a celebration. And one of the celebrations that's unique is they get to have dessert first. So the idea is to give them memories, not stuff. And it'll be different for every family, but create memories. A high school principal that I I was working with in uh, um, New Mexico, uh, she said, I've got three children. Uh, Two were in college and one is is out of college. And they were home for Christmas. Now, she said, "You, you need to know, all three of my students were the best students. They got all the awards. They got the valedictorian. They were just unbelievably good students. So I said to them, in in the garage, in the attic, there are bags, black garbage bags full of all the certificates each of you received. I've got three of them up there in the attic, one for each of you. All of this stuff that you were given. What do you want me to do with them? Simultaneously, all three kids said, trash them. They don't care. What they care about are the memories create memories. And it's a thank you. It's not a bribe. It's a thank you. You know, your mom and I were talking and we just can't believe how well you did. We were we were out there and there was trash on the ground and you guys just volunteered to pick it up on your own. I didn't tell you anything. I didn't say anything to you. You just did it. All of you, all three of you did that. We, we're just so proud of you. And we're, we're going to, you know, that, and then you know what favorite things your family likes to do. We're going to do that tonight. Maybe we're going to get in a, a circle in the living room and we're going to do a circle dance. That we just something. There's something you save and do as a family celebration. Look what we did together. Lee, you're hitting me here with, you're hitting me in the heart because I'm starting to realize now at the age of 45 that maybe the reason that I love school so much is because what you just described happened 
uh, in our families that we celebrated with. I remember the first time that I even told you a story before we turned the camera on about how I met Mark and, and we both tried to pick up the piece of trash on the ground yes. just because we wanted yes. to make an impact. And my, I remember my mom saying something similar to me a long time ago when I picked up something off the ground when I was in second grade. And as a result of that, she bought me an eraser in the store. She said, hey, you did really well. You didn't have to. And I want to reward you or something of that nature. Uh, I remember yes. getting this eraser. Uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah, it's coming together now. So where do I start? Uh, if I'm a parent right now, we'll start with parents first, and then we can talk about teachers and educators. Uh, but if, if I'm a parent and I would like to start to model or do something to help my family make some memories or celebrate, how might I start to think about this? Or what might it be a starting point, Lee? You pick out something that is a frustration okay. and you want it to get better. And then you, you get a sheet of paper and you create a graph. And you do it on a really bad day. Okay, so can you, is there a frustration that comes to mind? That Absolutely. Dinner time can be a frustration sometimes. Uh, getting off to school yeah. of the bus uh, can be a frustration. So a couple of examples, yes. Okay, so dinner. And what is it that's frustrating at dinner? Uh, well, we sit around the table, the five of us, uh, my wife and I and our three young daughters. And we will each share uh, a couple of highlights from the day. And a number of times it's difficult to... Uh, once one of the children is shared, uh, it's difficult sometimes to get them to sit still to listen to the rest of their sisters. They understand the being respectful, uh, until once they've gone and then they, they don't want to listen anymore. Sometimes that might be an example. So there's a behavior when they're not being good listeners. So on a particular, on a particular, uh, well, in classrooms, uh, the teacher might, uh, call that interruptions. Yours is a little different, but the teacher would track the number of interruptions, and then they just put a tick mark down each time there's an interruption. Yes. So you would, uh, when they're not paying attention to somebody else, they're being rude. So you just have a sheet of paper there, and when they're rude, you put a little tick mark down, and then you count, then you count up and say, well, uh, during dinner today, I, uh, your mom and I, and we counted up 12 roots. Okay, so we put the, the date, and we write, and, just, and your graph goes up to 12. And then to, let's see if we can do better tomorrow. And if it, does, if it gets better, then, then you have your whatever thing seems like a fun thing to do. It's just for, And you want it to be a minute. You don't want it to be long. A minute. A minute celebration. This is something we do. And then you just track it to see if we can get better and better and better. For what you're talking, you go with, we go with irritations. My funniest one was uh, working in Saskatchewan, and there were four uh, French teachers in the high school. They taught, some of the times they're teaching kids to speak in French, but most of the time they were teaching kids in French. Because they had three elementary schools, but one was French immersion, where their, all their instruction was in French. So they continued on in the high school. So they had, they're, they're taking all their different classes in French. So they, we had little clickers and they would they would click them like you go into an, a, an athletic event. and They're clicking how many people are there. Well, okay. the French teachers got little clickers. To count their irritations. And I thought, well, what are they irritated about? What what is it that they're so irritated about? Every time they heard an English word in the French class, they clicked, they clicked it. Because that was an irritation. You're not supposed to be speaking English in the French class. Yeah. Whether you're talking to me or somebody else, you got to speak French in the French class. So it, it individual just depends on what it is for a, a, a teacher or a parent or whatever. But everybody has irritations. Yeah. And so you're trying to reduce them. And each time it gets better, then that's an all-time best. Okay. And through this methodology, we can inspire them to love learning because they simply crave progress. And that experience of the celebration. The celebration. They remember those. When they're here, they'll say, when we had, when we did our had our best work or whatever, you won't believe what the crazy things my mom and dad did. And and by the way, one of the things kids enjoy in classrooms is when a teacher makes a fool of themselves. They laugh, they they love it. Another celebration that's just kind of a generic one is. They, they get to break the rule. 
So not, not okay. a rule that's dangerous, but teachers will say you can't uh, flip water bottles, your water bottles in the class. You can do that all you want after school, but you're not going to come into my classroom and flip your water bottle. So sometimes they've said, okay, our celebration for all-time best is tomorrow, you, everybody bring a water bottle. You get a minute to flip your water bottle. So it's not like it's a safety thing. It's that you, you're not going to give them permission to do something that's, that's unsafe, but something you don't want them to do. I've seen a number of different ways this is going to play out at the, at the dinner table tonight already. And I'm already starting to, you're getting the, uh, getting the juices flowing here. So I appreciate where we are right now, Lee. You know, let me tell you another thing. I don't know anybody doing this before, but it just came to mind. I was in a, a third grade and they were writing a book. <clears throat> Each kid was writing a book on uh, prefixes and suffixes. So teacher had up their ED for an ending and ING and, you know, different, different ones, T-I-O-N. And they had to pick a word and write a sentence about it and draw a picture. So a third grade girl wrote kissing. And then she had a picture of her mom and dad. And she said, I love it when my mom and dad kiss. So I mean, that, that's the silly thing. You have an all-time best and you kiss your wife. If this is the uh, the reason or excuse I need to kiss Julie, then uh, I'm all in. I'm looking for <laughs> celebrations now. Okay, <laughs> this is good. So we're seeing these numbers go from 95% in the younger years of kindergarten and they decrease they just decrease by the time you get to ninth grade you're at 37 percent actually like school right. or like learning and you have a, a pathway uh that's documented scientifically and it's been studied that this is going to help so yes. what's the challenge that we're facing now in getting this to mass scale and implementation okay the challenge is schools are inundated with problems and they bring people in to work with the teachers to help solve that problem. In most professions, people aren't looking for the root cause of the problem. I had lunch with an MD recently, and he said, one of the problems with medicine is we're often not looking for the root cause. We're treating a symptom and not looking for the root cause of the health problem. So that's true in, I think, many professions. So in education, if bullying is a problem, then we want to deal with bullying. But maybe the root cause is the data we use embarrasses certain kids and they're going to strike back. And I've had principals tell me where I've worked, and I've worked at a lot of schools across, all across the United States, but they'll say even our behavior is better because of what you're teaching about tracking the data and putting it up for a class and then also in schools, we add up the total for every classroom and put, and put that graph in the hallway. So they get to see the whole school's improving. And then it's, it's common in business and education that we set a goal. Everybody sits around and says, okay, this is how we did this year. Let's set a goal, to, you know. And the kids don't care about that goal. Actually, the, the adults don't care about it either. They just do it. So what we do is... That, when you have the total for the whole school or the classroom, the goal is to be the best class ever. So the kids buy into that. They want to have bragging rights that they're doing better than any other class this teacher had. Or, the, or for the whole school, we're doing better than all the kids did last year. We're doing even better. That's a, a goal they aspire to meeting. What I'm hearing is the goal, whether... The goal itself matters not. What matters is be able to show over time that they're improving and yes. empowering them to have a sense of pride that they're improving. And when that happens, the teachers don't pressure the kids to learn more. The kids pressure the teacher to teach more. That changes the whole dynamic. You want teachers complaining. I haven't got time to keep up with all these kids want to learn because they get great joy. They will say in elementary school, how come we don't have a graph for this subject? But it's all the way through. In, in North Carolina, you know, up in the Statesville, I was there recently. I'd been there 10 years ago and then came back. And one of the high school teachers teaching seniors said, I've been using this ever since. 
My kids love what you've taught us. They're seniors in high school, especially the jocks. They get it because they're used to it. They love it. And it's so simple. Now, you do have to tell the, the hard part is the teachers have to tell the kids what they want them to know at the end of the year. Okay. And then you're tracking their progress towards that all the way through. So they don't get a quiz on the chapter they just studied. They get a quiz on a random sample of the end of the year expectations. And every and, and almost every week, they're taking a, a random sample from the end of the year expectations so that you know a third of the way through the year, do I know a third of the content? Halfway through the year, do I know half of the content? All through the year, they know if they're on track to know all of it by the end of the year and have it in their long-term memory. So let's talk about first grade spelling because I mentioned that story earlier with the grandma and the first yes. grader. Typically, a teacher, a teacher that's doing what I teach, and and um, on the and the behind me, there's a picture of a first grade teacher that on the cover of the book, and this is from her classroom. The first graders get the list of all 150 spelling words for the whole year, the first week of school. They get the whole list. Mom and dad get it. Kids have it. And each week when the teacher walks around the room, she has a bucket. And in that bucket are all 150 words written on a sheet of paper. And she pulls out 12. And that's their spelling test. Pulls them out at random. Well, in the beginning, they're going to miss most of them. They get it. The kids understand. It's baseline data. And then it goes through the year. It goes up and up, but not up every week. Yes. You, you know, you get harder words coming out at random. But what, what I'm leading to, by the end of the year, you want the kids to be able to spell any 12 words that are pulled out of the, out of the bucket and spell them all, not because they studied them the night before with mom, because it's in their head. And that's why I'm not telling them the 12 words every week. Hey, here's your calendar. Study these 12 this week. You tell them, a, I guess, the quiz itself, the first one informs them of here's the 12 for this week. So they they really cannot able to prepare for it because they don't know which ones are going to be the words. No. It's just 12. Okay. And I know sometimes it's a good luck week and sometimes it's a bad luck week, but overall there's progress. And that's just, a, but that's in every subject, every grade level. What do you want them to know at the end of the year? And we're going to, we're going to, man, we're going to measure our progress towards that. I can see it. I'm ready to draw my first graph. Hopefully not tonight. I hope it's a great night, <laughs> but you know, soon, whenever that happens, uh, love to draw it. And, and I remember kind of the story that resonates with me as you're sharing uh, this methodology, Lee. I remember back when I was in high school and high school basketball, I was not the best player on the team by far. I was, I was definitely riding the bench a good portion of the time. I do remember that second half of the season, when conference play started, we would get our lockers covered with this big poster. And every time we got a point, you get a, like a sticker, a ball, three points gets you a sticker, you know, th two rebounds gets you a sticker. The most coveted sticker was the Iron Man sticker. And that was the person who could take a charge. And I didn't score oh. a whole lot of points. Uh, I did get two Iron Man stickers. And those <laughs> were the things that we celebrated the most were the Iron Man stickers. Uh, so I, I do recall that I was eager to get the Iron Man sticker. Uh, oh. and, uh, I, I, I remember that clearly, but back to progress. So what does progress look like? We're battling, uh, something then we're not winning the war. If you look at it just from one statistical, just one snapshot, how might we show progress over time and getting this message out to our education system, Lee? It's actually with the leaders in the school system because it's whoever has the pocketbook is the one that determines what is it that the teachers are, are going to, uh, the meetings they go to, what they're going to hear. And this is what I would, my, my overall advice would be to school administrators, because there's a huge teacher shortage across the country. And when you ask teachers why, they will almost always say, because my freedom to teach the way I want to teach is gone. Expensive programs have been purchased by the school district and I'm required to use them. If the leaders in the school system would say to teachers, here's what you're supposed to know, their kids are supposed to know at the end of the year. Along the way, we want you to be able to show evidence that your kids are learning this. 
but you've got freedom to use your personality and your knowledge to help the kids learn what we want them to learn by the end of the year. It's not happening. The Uh teachers are not recommending that their children and grandchildren become teachers because it's not been a joyful ride. And it should be. It should be really, really joyful. I totally agree. And we get we're inundated with uh, all different kinds of reports and bureaucracy and stuff that does not inspire teachers. They don't want to do it that way. Uh, I see right. it because I have a couple of clients who are in the education space and then, you know, see and hear from them. I don't know if it's solvable in one conversation or in one way, but we can make progress in some way, shape or form. One teacher, one district, one principal at a time. Yeah, how are the how are what are more methods that might help us to get to this place? Well, people learn from people they trust. And so we need many more people that will understand what we've talked about today and will share it with the people they know that trust them. Um, I don't know any other way for that to happen. Uh, that other than because people believe word of mouth, people they trust. You, you can't legislate what I just said. What you can do is stop punishing the people that are leading the schools for um, test scores. Okay, when No Child Left Behind was passed, and now we've got something instead of it, what Congress thought was, if um, we pressure the states to have better test scores, that'll help. So what do the leaders in the state do? They didn't take the pressure. They passed it on to the school superintendents. School superintendents said, I'm not teaching in the classroom. What am I going to do? So then they pressured the principals. What did the principals do? They pressured the teachers. What did the teachers do? They pressured the kids. So it's a flawed system. The pressure is not going to make things better. It has to come from inside. And the people that are there want it better. We have to help them want it better. And to get them to want it better, uh, it will be through showing them that they have made progress and that they are doing better yes. than before. Yes. And any yes. visual aids we can use to get there, any collaborative, like the team total of the classroom we might use to get there, by any means we can get there by showing progress. So when the teachers are have that class total, and they're doing, and they can say to kids, wow, it happens at about eight, late April. Wow, we passed last year's total. The class, the class they had last year, we know how well they did, and you just passed it. You did, you've done better than any class I've had before. And the teachers get as much joy from that as the kids. They went to teaching for the right reasons, and they want that joy also, and they don't get it. It's an annual test that tells them how they're doing. I worked in inter, I worked in inner city schools. Some of the best teachers I've seen in my whole life are in the inner city. They get no credit because the test scores are low in the newspaper. Sounds like an sure. incredibly difficult uh, task to teach uh, when it's not just uh, grades, but there's also everything outside of school. Sure, it's a, it's a, it's a challenging job, and some of them are just up to the task, and they do so well. Mm-hmm. Doesn't that, doesn't matter. Like a lot of systems in our country, it needs it needs reform, but it's not it's not going to come from Congress. They have, they don't have the they can't do it. Well, Lee, I I appreciate uh, because my kids are right in the middle of this right now. They're young. They're on the front end of school. Uh, I enjoyed school. I hope they do as well. And these are great mm-hmm. strategies that parents might use. I, I wonder what applications. If we cross over to a different vertical, say in business, for example, I wonder how this same style of learning uh, might you know, lend itself towards uh, people enjoying what they do at work more. Is there a correlation? Okay. Yeah, there is. Um, my book is How to Create a Perfect School and How to Create a Perfect Homeschool. The word perfect comes from business. It comes from books I've read up by, written about Toyota. And when they're doing their strategic planning, the first thing they do is say, what would perfect be? Then they say, we will never be perfect. Then they say, where are we now? And the last thing is, 
what plans can we put in place to get us closer to perfect? So the title, How to Create a Perfect School, is I had to decide what perfect was. So what's perfect? That the love of learning children bring to kindergarten is maintained the next 12 years. That would be perfect. We've talked about that. And then where are we now? Well, it depends on your grade level. You can look at it. You can see. And we can. everybody can do something to get closer. The educators have to stop blaming the parents and society and all kinds of other stuff. When fewer than 10% of the kids still love learning at the end of 12th, by, in 11th and 12th grade, that's not the parents' fault. You can't say 90% of our families are messed up. They're not. You have to say, okay, yeah, there's messed up families. We know that. Yeah, society's messed up. Yeah, but not 90%. What are we going to do? John Hattie, I've mentioned twice already. This will help. It'll help in business. It'll help in education, but it's triplets that he shares. It's skill, will, and thrill. So in business and education, what do we want? We want people to gain the skill they need to excel. However, if they don't have the will to work hard and there's no thrill from the, from the learning, they'll never get the skill. So okay. it's, it's business. You want your employees to work hard. You want them to get joy from the work and to be constantly searching to, to improve their skill. And if people just remember, it's skill, it's not skill alone. That's all the test measure is skill. No, it's skill, will, and thrill. Yeah. If I um, recently watched in Oklahoma, I have a son in Oklahoma also, and it's his house. And out in the front was a tarantula wasp dragging the tarantula to its nest. And then the tarantula wasp would stop, go off for a while, and then come back and drag the, the tarantula some more, and then stop and then drag her some more. So what's going on? The tarantula wasp stings the tarantula and paralyzes it. And the tarantula is being drugged to the tarantula wasp nest. And she lays her eggs on the live tarantula who can't move. And when the eggs hatch, they have their meal. Oof. I know. So <laughs> that was gonna, just a little doozy you snuck in there. Wow. Yeah, it was. Okay. okay. So <laughs> we, why am I sharing that? When the kids lose their will and thrill, then the adults are dragging the kid to the graduation finish line. And the kids don't want to be drunk. And the parents are adding more bribes and more pressure and more things to drag them across the line. But if the kids keep the will and thrill they were born with, they will gain the skill. So I mentioned earlier, my friend, that's a high school dropout that said I wasn't on the chart because I wasn't there. I said, yeah, that was my parents. They were dragging and dragging and dragging, but they didn't make it. I dropped out. That's what's happening all over. We're dragging these kids to the graduation line and they're kicking and screaming the whole way. But if you just kept the will and thrill they had as a kindergartner, you wouldn't have to do that. So the advice that, that teachers have and that parents have is stop motivating your kids. Stop it. That's bad advice to motivate them. They were born motivated. God gave them motivation to learn the, the, the instant they were born, probably mm -hmm. before they were born. They still have it when they're five and six and seven. They still have that inborn desire to learn. So the job is not to motivate them to learn. The job is to maintain the, the motivation they were born with. On my website, which is ltj.net, under free resources, there's a graph for parents and teachers to measure will and thrill. The one I talked about earlier is measuring skill. But we can measure will and thrill. They'll tell you where they are. Across the bottom of the graph, it's, it goes from I hate it to I love it. And on the, on the, on the y-axis, it's um, going up from I'm doing nothing to I'm all in, I'm 100%. And, there's, and on that, they, the kids will tell you where they are, on their will and through. That's the most important thing to monitor. Okay. Because if that's, if that's high and the kids say, I love it and I'm all in, 100% effort, you don't have an issue. 
But when they say, I hate it and I'm doing nothing, you're just think of the tarantula and the tarantula wasp, you're dragging them. That is a wonderful analogy and it has stuck in my brain. Uh, well, for the reason of uh, laying the eggs on it, it's, it's going to stay there. Uh, but the, uh, the the brilliance behind it, uh, the the skill, the will, and the thrill, I certainly appreciate that. Where might our audience go, Lee, to uh, to find out any anything else about you? You said your website, so if you could please share that again, and any other places, your books, anything that we might do to find out more about education and what you're up to. Okay. Well, first of all, there is the website, ltj.net. They can follow me on uh, Facebook. Uh, um, follow me on uh, Instagram, on LinkedIn. The um, can email me. It's Lee at ltoj.net. You say that, I'll say it again. Lee at ltoj.net. And so sometimes people ask, what does LTJ mean? It's it's a graph we put in classrooms. Everybody knows what the bell curve is. We're starting off the year with an L-shaped curve. We're going through the bell at the middle of the year. We want to get to a J-shaped graph at the end of the year. Yeah. It's all moved. The whole thing's moving. So once you picture the bell, that's for the middle of the year. You want this L, your L over here. But I can, I'm in screen. Okay. The L through the bell to the J. So it's Lee at L to J dot net. And I'd be happy to talk to people. Lee at L to J dot net. Awesome. Well, Lee, this has been. Uh, from where I sit, someone who's looking through the lens of someone who has children and wants to inspire uh, or sure. take the motivation that they already have and continue to you know, bring that out and let them live with that. So I'm looking at it from a parental lens. And I'm also looking at it from a lens of a business leader, of someone who is you know, always seeing organizations that are trying to motivate and inspire people. and. Sure. You know, they're not doing great at it sometimes. Sometimes they are. But I'm looking at it from a couple different lenses. Uh, I certainly appreciate what you shared. I'm going to share it in my community, the Front Row Dads. Uh, you know, maybe make some introductions if you're interested in other, other shows. But I would say that uh, this has been very, very insightful and helpful uh, from someone who's very interested in the education space. So uh, and, thank you. Thank you. And, you know, uh, you mentioned Mark Victor Hansel along the way. One of the things he helped me with was if nobody's interested in, not interested in education at all, there's a fun book I did with him. All about Henry. They'll see it on the website too. It's fiction. Okay. Okay. It's, it's a rich widower. So just for those people that, oh, education, oh, oh, I'm beyond that. Okay. There's a fun book, fiction, that is in the Mark Victor Hansen Library. All about Henry. Okay. So, I'll link to all these things in the show notes so uh, our listeners can go and check all those out. And uh, Lee, I'll, I'll offer you the last word today. If there's any uh, last wisdom or thoughts you'd like to share, with our listeners around education or overcoming challenges or just anything on your mind. I'd love to give you the last word before we well, sign off. I'll just share because your title, Matt, the eternal optimist. I am an optimist. There is hope for the schools to get better. They just don't know all what to do. Um, they're, they're grabbing at straws and it goes back to perfect. If you know what perfect is, then you can get closer and closer and closer. But if you don't know, then you just, Whatever's in the system on the media, you grab this idea, you go to a conference, grab another idea. Two years later, it's, it's no, not around, but you grab another idea. You just, at chaos. But if you know what perfect is and you stay there, you can get closer and closer and closer. And our schools can get better, whether they're private schools, charter schools, public schools, or if it's a home school. All of them can get better, but they have to know what perfect would be and strive to get closer. And if they do that, the optimism will come to life. I would get closer. Got it. Thank you, Lee. Appreciate okay. you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. This has been a joy. Yeah.